I again. In John Wesley Brady's This Freedom Whence, England Before and After Wesley, he's on the subject of John Howard and the early generations of prison reform in Britain. More on Howard's work here and what he discovered as to the British prison system. Nevertheless, it was left to the moral chivalry of John Howard, the country gentleman, whom Green pronounces the most energetic and zealous of reformers, so to challenge the emergent social conscience and to make humane and redemptive prison conditions a matter of public concern. When Howard, in 1773, after his appointment as High Sheriff of Bedfordshire, began the investigation of English prisons, he found the whole system of confinement a wilderness of cruelty, immorality, and graft. Few jail keepers got any stated stipend, hence being dependent upon guile and extortion for their livelihood, they commonly represented the basest type of manhood. County jails alone were under the control of sheriffs, while on all sides, sections of counties, municipal corporations, liberties, and even private individuals ran jails. Some of them old towers or castles, some dungeon rooms under courthouses or town halls, some even the dark, filthy cellars of public houses. And the insecurity of many of these incarceration quarters afforded excuse for the use of irons, straitjackets, and chains. Men, women, and children frequently were huddled together in common dens of despair. Disease, prostitution, drunkenness, and general debauchery were rife. Semi-starvation was common, and sometimes only the generosity of felons who legally could claim county bread saved luckless debtors from starvation. Indeed, the chief hope of the prisoner lay in the fact that, owing to the overcrowding of jails, the legislature frequently was obliged to make a general arbitrary jail delivery and at once to set open by its sovereign authority all the prisons in England. It was well for the cause of prison reform that spiritual fire had possessed the soul of a country gentleman, a man of social position, financial independence, physical hardihood, indomitable will, and amazing pertinacity. If Howard was a teetotaler, he nevertheless was a country squire, and as such he had to be respected. Hence, though when Wesley and his preachers criticized prison conditions, they, in many quarters, could be laughed out of court as ranting fanatics. With Howard, the case was different. He, moreover, had access to many jails from which they were excluded. And when once the challenge presented itself, he was in a position to make prison reform an exclusive mission, and to finance his own life crusade. Early in his investigations, Howard discovered, among the inmates of English prisons, persons languishing for months without even having been brought to trial. Persons in court declared not guilty, persons whose prosecutors had failed to, put, to appear, and persons against whom grand juries could lay no charge. They were detained because unable to pay the jailer's fees. Rising commonly about 3 a.m., Four times during his 17 years of solitary crusade did Howard inspect the jails of the entire United Kingdom. Repeatedly, amidst incredible traveling difficulties, he visited, notebook in hand, the, the principal prisons, lazarettos, and workhouses of a dozen European countries, though in more than one quarter admission was gained only by disguise. Before Howard, on January 20th, 1790, died of malignant jail fever in Russia, he had traveled more than 50,000 miles in the prisoner's cause. Refusing government assistance, he had expended 30,000 pounds of his own fortune. He had shut himself up in foul dungeons that he might experience something of the anguish of his fellow men. Without reserve, he had given his time, his talents, his means. He had made sensitive souls in many lands to feel for the criminal a new sympathy as a fellow mortal who by humane treatment, practical education, and spiritual guidance might be reclaimed to an upright life. In a unique sense, Howard remains the father of all modern prison reform. For his humanity and zeal, he received the official thanks of the House of Commons. As a direct result of his labors, different reforming acts were placed on this, the statute books and scores of decently constructed prisons were reared to take the place of previous dungeons. Yet so great were the interests involved 
that thoroughgoing prison reform remained for decades a crying need, nor even today, that is in around 1940, is it achieved. Next time Brady goes on to talk about Jeremy Bentham and also the great reformer Elizabeth Fry, who had immense impact on the prison systems. I'll put in a link to Lord Shaftesbury's heroic labors a generation or two later, Shaftesbury's heroic labors in Parliament in Britain to remedy the horrors of the Industrial Revolution. <laughs>